uh, begin next session. I would like to turn your attention uh, already at the beginning uh, that uh, there are some uh, last minute changes in the conference program and uh, we want here today uh, the paper uh, by uh, Victoria Jonkute. Uh, she will present her paper uh, tomorrow uh, during the first session, during the morning session, uh, on the uh, first floor conference room. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, ask uh, this panel's speakers uh, to take their places. And already during the uh, first session uh, this morning, uh, uh, questions of national ideology, national identity, and uh, memory uh, were touched upon. And uh, we will continue to, to, uh, to talk about uh, those topics uh, during this session. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce first speaker, uh, uh, Miguel Angel Perez Sanchez. Uh, he is uh, uh, lector uh, in the Department of uh, Romanic Studies at the University of Latvia. Uh, he has uh, studied uh, Spanish philology in Spain and uh, he has worked at the University of Latvia for a six or seven years already, and uh, he is interested in comparative literature and romanticism. Uh, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, good morning. I'm going to uh, try to develop in my paper some, res uh, some, res uh, some comparative research about uh, the national epic in the 19th century. <coughs> I want a hero, an uncommon one, when every year and month sends forth a new one, till after crowing the cassettes with Kent, the age discover he is not the true one. Of such as this, I should not care to bound. I therefore take our ancient friend, Don Juan. We all have seen him in the pantomime, sent to the devil somewhat ere his time. Byron's request for a hero and uncommon one, at the beginning of his unfinished long poem, Don Juan, is that of a generation of English romantics who envisioned poetry not only as a vehicle for the search of identity and self-understanding, but in rough uh, outlines is one of the main characteristics of, of, his broad literary uh, of this broad literary movement, but also as a vehicle that had to adopt the appearance of an epic, either to follow in one or other sense its conventions or to call them into question and reject them. Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, Byron, nowadays still well-known poets by the educated reader, all of them in different moments of their literary careers went into the epic form composing lengthy works in what Robert Southey, himself a romantic poet, called epomania. Milton, with his Paradise Lost, provided provided the mirror in which several generations of English poets, since William Blake, who made of Milton the hero one of his major poems, till the previously mentioned ones, watched themselves and what for, and that for two reasons, both of significant importance to our purpose. Firstly, because Milton was seen as the highest literary exponent of a long Protestant religious tradition of descent and intellectual and spiritual independence, and his work, as the critic Harold Bloom state, interpreted in a sense of inner freedom and rupture with the artistic convention, conventions of the past. But not less importantly, because Milton appeared through uh, his eulogizers, the author of the most successful heroic epic of Christian subject, after Dante, as much as the hero of his own life, a prophet poet capable of defeating symbolically the old religion to gain eternal truth, truth in Blake's vision and self-knowledge in the vision of Wordsworth or Byron. 
Lillian R. Fast, in her influential, influential article, Romanticism in Historical Perspective, has demonstrated that the Romantic movement was not a, a homogeneous one, but had independent sources and different phases. The spread of Romanticism is characterized by curious time lags and unexpected spark, she writes. Starting in England a few decades before the turn of the century, although the first signs of change could be located already into the mid-century, following in Germany with the rebellion of the Sturm und Drang against the restriction of political, ideological, and literary force of the time, to grow up later under the guise of the well-differentiated groups of Jena and Heidelberg. Only in the second decade of the 19th century, England comes back to be the focus of the European Romanticism, and this only for those 10 years, after which finally Romanticism penetrates France, where even in the revolution of uh, uh, 1789 had created a public habit for rapid and truculent emotions. Napoleon's empire, through censorship and preference for classical grandeur, had had the paradoxical effect of paralyzing the necessity for a new kind of literature, which was seen in its foreign manifestations as associated with the revolution and therefore stigmatized. Since this moment, and in relation with their own political circumstances, a late wave of romanticism spread across the rest of the European continent in coexistence more or less contemporary with the taste for realism that the rising capitalist society was starting to reveal. These political circumstances, along with other ones of social, social and ethnographic kind, retarded the appearance of romantic signs as much as affected their face, for broadly speaking, the main characteristic in the slate wave, wave is its manifestation as nationalism understood from an ideological and programmatical point of view. Nationalism that in the cases of the old nation states of England, France, Spain, and Russia could adopt the aspect of patriotism or, sim or simple nostalgia for the past, but in the cases of regions with a problematic identity took the form of an active defense of what Robert Benedict Anderson called emerging communities. Among the European communities with a problematic identity, difference should be made between the ones who tended to unification or smaller parts, Germany and Italy, and those who was inclined to a separation from a bigger nation and which could be grouped in three areas, Mediterranean area, uh, Central European and Balkan area, and Baltic area. Nevertheless, we should bear in mind that the processes which along the 19th century and continuing into the 20th century, <coughs> and in some cases arriving till our days, resulted in the creation of differentiated nations, were not homogeneous as far as the development of these processes went through, uh, went through the three phases of nationalism established by, by Hrock with a particular rhythm and not always fulfilling uh, very, uh, very phase, every phase. It was Germany, paradoxically a nation of addition, not of subtraction, who provided since the end of the 18th century the philosophical basis on which nationalism as an ideology was founded, and later, since the 60s of the 19th century, exported its Bismarckian imperialist receipt of how to build a nation. Specifically, specifically, it was the German idealism who, through the works of Herder, Fichte, and Hegel, bid, uh, built up what the Spanish philosopher Gustavo Bueno has described in a prominent study as an obscurantist myth, that is, the invention of the idea of objective culture as a substitute of mo or modern equivalent of the spiritual kingdom of grace. In short, the Christian soteriological conception of a fallen humanity that God raises by means of the grace, expressed through a set of external elements like rebuilt books or temples, as we can find already in St. Augustine writings, and the fragmentation of the Roman Empire in a small medieval states coordinated by the central spiritual power of Rome, are both links of a chain that after Luther reform 
and the secularization of society started in the end of the 17th century led in Germany itself eventually a fallen nation and therefore an enabling environment for these ideas to the born of Herder's philosophy in which the human being is raised to the condition of cultural animal in a process of historical objectivation. For history, in his thought, becomes supra-individual and supra-subjective, and culture, the envelopment for the possibility of mankind and every people inside the mankind to reach its status above and opposed to nature. Finally, Fichte and Hegel gave further development to this idea, conceiving culture, the secular equivalent to the kingdom of grace, in parallel with nation for nation, its statal form, and ultimately Germany, was understood as something given, former to the human being, uh, in the last state, it can be considered the last state in the human spiritual process, the fall guys. In conjunction with the exaltation of culture as the cornerstone and one of the main constituents of a new Weltanschauung, started a movement of revelation of the past, that is, the medieval past, in opposition to the universalist and in a good degree timeless conception of history developed by neoclassicism. It showed on several manifestations of folk poesy, poetry, one of the first being in 1760, the publication of fragments of ancient poetry by the Scottish poet James Macpherson, which quickly spread beyond the British coast and produced a real fashion for the recovering of what Friedrich Schlegel labeled as the, express, uh, as the expression of uh, the pure language, a language before the fall. The Brothers Grimm in Germany, or Buk Karacic in Serbia, are among the most eminent collectors of popular songs and tales in the early moments of the folklorist movement. Although the limits of folklore and what Richard Dawson called fake lore, fails folklore with the appearance of a real one, were not obvious at the time. Thus, Macpherson, with his ocean, whose ballad his editor claimed to have collected and translated from Gaelic into English when in fact adapted and modified uh, on his own taste. All these factors contributed to the need of a narration with enough strength that could support a myth like the nationalist one, which even if was not perceived like a myth, neither could be perceived like supported by a strasomatic objective facts and that kind of powerful narration according to the generic conventions of the 18th century Europe still surviving in the next century only could be carried forward by the epic general. For since, uh, for since antiquity, uh, the epic genre was among the three defined by Aristotle, epic, lyric, and dramatic, the most prestigious one, and that even in spite of the upheavals this genre suffered in its almost 3,000 years of Western history. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so. National romanticism, for their own propagandistic purposes, uses the nationalist thought contained in the innate, filtered through the classical doctrine and manipulated by the physical idealism <clears throat> as much as the formal liberty of the Homeric poems that refer to the, to the breaking of rules of the neoclassical period. And that is a critical difference that should always be borne in mind between the poetics of English, French, Spanish, or Russian romantics and that of romantics of nations in real or imaginary process of building, depending on, on which one of the rock faces could be placed in this process. Of the three main areas in which previously we divided the 19th century Europe, by its nationalist tendencies, three epic points we would like to highlight in order to contextualize them both in their policy system and in the framework of the larger policy system of European literature, to which they belong despite the fact that the Western canon has kept them at best in a static canonicity, and more frequently in a simple ignorance. 
and this will uh, the well, the Balkan area was characterized in the 19th century by the continuing efforts to escape the historical domination of the Ottoman Empire and the neighboring emergent major power of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Although in the Middle Ages Serbia and Croatia had been independent kingdoms, since the defeat of the Serbian troops by the invading army of the Ottoman Empire in the Battle of Kosovo Field in um, 1389 and the defeats of Croatian troops in the Battle of uh, Krevava, uh, 1493, field and the Battle of Mohat, uh, 1526, after what the Croatian parliament chose the House of Asburg as new ruler of the country. This continuous state of violence due to blurred boundaries <coughs> and a warlike population contributed for centuries to the creation of a big body of oral epic poetry similar in composition as Alfred Lord and Milman Perry demonstrated to the ancient epic poetry of Greeks and other peoples and alive even till recent time. Book Karacit, the reformer of the Serbian language and orthography, <coughs> gained a well-deserved fame throughout Europe as collector of folkloric poetry, ballads, epic songs, lyrics. Admired and read from England to Russia, his influence could be tracked in Goethe, the Green Brothers, Lamartine, Pushkin, Runeberg, the composer of the second more important national epic about after the Kalevala in Finland, or lately in the works of the also folklore collector, the Latvian Christianis Barons. This influence is noticeable in the figure of his compatriot. This term understood in, the, in an ethnic sense, Petar Petrovich Niagos, prince and bishop, and bishop Vladika of Montenegro, an author of one of the most significant national epics of the century, Gorski Vienat, The Mountain Red, published in 1847. Himself a collector of oral poetry like Karachit, Bol, were friends. Niagos, not a scholar, but a ruler of one of the most wildest, illiterate, and bellicose regions of the south of Europe, at the of Europe at the time, and for some reason extremely rich, uh, for, uh, for the same rich reason, extremely rich in epic poetry, was also romantic through the teachings of his master, the Serbian poet, Sima Milutinovic, and a philosopher deeply involved, literary and politically, in the fight for the liberation of his people and the Balkans of the Turks, in the Balkans of the Turks oppression. Gorski Vienat is an epic poem of uh, 2,819 verses that adopts the form of a tragedy not thought to be played due to the huge number of characters and the vagueness of time and space in which the minimal action is developed. The plot is based on the legendary event of the killing of Muslim converts for their Orthodox compatriots compatriots, supposedly happened at the end of the 17th century, and tells about the doubts which beset to the bishop, Danilo, about the legitimacy of the, this procedure and his efforts to give it a better solution by means of dialogue, solution that, the, that at the end proves to be impossible. Also considered during Niago's life an authentic event, researchers, researchers like Antoine Sidotti have demonstrated that the massacre never happened at all. In the Mediterranean area, the national consciousness woke up in those territories which, in the creation of the supranational identities of France and Spain during the late Middle Ages, had been politically sallowed, and their languages and literature, despite having showed some splendor, pushed aside by their own users toward the benefits of a more universal and powerful culture. In Spain, the Galician and Catalonian movements of Renaissance, Resurdimento and Renaissance, respectively, and in France, and the Occitan Felibres movement didn't go beyond the phase of secular interest. Although, in the Catalonian case, a real period of patriotic agitation would took place in the turn of the 19th century and first decades of the 20th century. The, the main features of these movements were the scholar and bourgeois origin of their propagandists, conservatives in ideology, 
on the revival in public manifestations of medieval literary and courtly institutions, job florals in Catalonia, or court d'amour in, in Provence, and a great concern for the standardization of the language. Jacinth Verdaguer, priest and laureate poet of the Renaissance Catalan movement, proceeded, preceded by a dual tradition of epic poetry datable to about the 18th century and under the influence of the uh, Renaissance Catalan's program and scholars like Emilai Fontanals or Bonaventura Carles Aribau, who had argued the need of a renovation of the epic classic traditions to be adapted in form and matter to the times, published in 18 uh, in 1886, Canico, the epic poem largely weighted by the La Catalan intelligentsia and immediately received as the national epic of the nation in which its origins and destiny had successfully put in a poetic way. The subject of Canigo divided in 12 songs is simple. The epoch, uh, in the epoch of the Christian reconquest against the Muslim occupation of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, Gentil, the song of Count Tallaferro, Disobeying his father's and uncle's order, orders, defeats, uh, def uh, defects his military obligations to run after the love of Flordeneu, the queen of fairies, who inhabits the Canigo mountain in the Pyrenees and at whose side learns their history and legends till his uncle, Count Giffray, finds him and blames him for the last defeat of the Christian army in the hands of the Moors, kills him after what repented in order to atone for his sins found San Martí de Cuixá, later becoming San Martí de Ripoll, mythical cradle of the Catalanian the nation. Along the 19th century in the Baltic area, the Romanticism was introduced in different stages and unevenly, unevenly. The regions under Russian influence, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, suffered a scarce social evolution with a small number of cities and a high percentage of peace and still living under feudal regime. Several policies of Russification started to be promoted since middle century, especially in Lithuania after the unsuccessful uprisings in 1831 and 1863, with the ban of, uh, of the Lithuanian press and the cultural and educational closure from institutions. On the other hand, several measures for the emancipation of serfs were adopted alone as soon as the beginning of the century, uh, 1816 in the province of Estonia and 1819 in the province of Livonia, although only were fully successful uh, to the 60s. All the social political situation led the Baltic area to be, uh, to be one of the last ones in Europe to receive the Romantic movement and just in the way of national romanticism. The final publication of the Kalevala in 1847 by the doctor and scholar Elias, Elias Ronrod, after two decades of field work collecting folk poetry, especially from Finnish Karelia, was regarded by the Finnish intelligentsia as a cornerstone of the awakening movement, an authentic oral epic, and Ronrod as an oral poet, a kind of Homer. To the Kalevala succeeded uh, in Estonia the publications by Frederick Reinhold Kreuzval in 1853 of the first version of the epic poem Kalevi Poet, Caleb Son, and the 1888 in Latvia, Andris Pumpur's Last Places, the Beer Slayer. It took Pumpur's almost 20 years to finish his epic uh, Last Places, succeeding in his reception among the Latvian public, where previous attempts between the 60s and the 70s of creating a national epic had failed. The subject of the poem is the fight of the mythical hero Lats Places for defeating the German crusaders that in the 13th century invaded Latvian territories and imposed their presence for the next 700 years. Lats Places, in spite of some victories over the enemy, finally is unable to fulfill the divine mission with the Baltic gods imposed on him and disappearing in the Daugavu waters to return in the future when the day of liberation arrives for the Latvian people. I don't have more time. Okay. Uh, my article follows fun. Okay, but uh, maybe we, we could state that uh, this kind of uh, national epics. My article uh, concludes with uh, that kind of uh, national epics uh, has a sub, uh, have have a subtext. 
uh, related uh, with biblical motives mm, and uh, the traditional hero of the uh, ancient epic, uh, the, the Homer and uh, the, uh, the Virgilian uh, poems, are transformed in a, in a type in words of uh, Northrop Fry, the critical North, uh, the critical Northrop uh, Fry, of a type of uh, or archetype of uh, the the messianic figure of uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your very stimulating presentation, and. Uh, We'll go uh, further. Our next speaker is Olga Basilevica. Uh, Olga has studied um, uh, German uh, studies and comparative literature in both Riga and uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, currently, she is um, a PhD student uh, at the Justus Liebig uh, University in uh, Gießen, Germany. And uh, she writes her uh, PhD thesis uh, about uh, um, uh, German, uh, Latvian, and Russian uh, memory fiction. Uh, please, Olga. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I will have to say right away that it's part of a bigger project. Um, I'm still working on a PhD. Um, and because of time constraints, I will only talk about one of the aspects um, of these novels, of, of the way that you compare them. This is what I call the de-demonification and normalization of the socialist past. Um, and it will be, differently than most of the papers so far, rather a close reading and a rather lightweight on theory. Bear with me, please. Um, none of these novels is translated, so all the translations on your handouts are done by me. And as a comparatist, I left the originals for you to enjoy them too, if you can read German or Latvian. So I will begin now with a short introduction of the two novels. Dimitri Latvia, or Born for Latvia, is a 2013 novel written by young, young Latvian author Ruta Mezhavelka. It is narrated on two levels, and you can see it on your handout number two. On level one, it is one day in the life of a young, um, young woman protagonist, Anna, in March 2005, which is being told by a third person narrator. On level two, an adolescent first person narrator is telling the story of her first love, set in Riga between um, 1986 and 1990. Quite early in the text, we can realize that um, the protagonist of level one is actually the uh, future self of the first person narrator of the level two. So the narration of the level two can be seen as her first uh, field memories, which is as narrated without a frame as experienced now. In today's paper, I will, however, mostly work with the level two of the novel. When I grow up, I will Stern, or um, when I grow up, I will fly by to the stars, um, has a much simpler narrative structure, typical for the genre of childhood memories fiction. Here, childhood memories are told in chronological order. Even though the narrator can be identified as an adult, the narration takes up a child's perspective with only few markers of the adult remembering narrator. The span of the narrated time is longer than in Zimish Latvia. It begins in the early childhood, probably somewhere in preschool age, and ends with the 14th year of the narrator. In this paper, I will only deal with the last chapter, which is dealing with youth consecration, that is the time where the narrator has surely entered um, adolescence. Both of the ad uh, narrated adolescences are set in socialist states, in Eastern Germany and Soviet Latvia, while the narrated time in uh, Dimitri Latvia is set several decades later than in Avanich Kospen. It can be assumed that the German book I'm talking about, the um, narrated time is spent somewhere between mid-60s and mid-70s. 
And while the setting in different decades and states is surely a large discrepancy, I argue that the novels can be compared based on certain similarities in the way in which they deal with historical reality. I will have to leave out today the discussion on the comparability of novels dealing with such different political and historical situations and plan to discuss it in length in my dissertation. I will now move to a short analysis of Dimitri Latve. The historical events that constitute the background of the narrative level of, two, lev <coughs> sorry, of, the, narrative of the level two in Dimitri Latvia reflect on one of the most important moments of the history of modern Latvia. The beginning of the so-called Third Awakening, or Tresha Atmode, in 1987, and the developments of the following year that lead to the regaining of independence in 1991. The image of these events in the official memory culture of Latvia is best described by the words of Dinis Ivans, one of the leaders of the movement in his speech in 2013. That quote is on your handout. I quote, one could get disappointed in everything, but one cannot get disappointed in Atmode. We are a land chosen by God and peoples chosen by God, just our, like our brothers, Estonian, Lithuanians and Estonians." End of quote. 27 years after the beginning of the movements and 23 years after the recovery of the independence, Atmode is seen as a kind of sacred moment in the history of a country and its people. For Ivans, it cannot be disappointing. It cannot be seen critical. While other social and political developments can be upsetting, Atmode should remain untouchable. The metaphor of awakening suggests a passive before state, a sleep that has to be ended, a nightmare that is awoken by an active act of change. Once one is awakened, the traces of the sleep fade <clears throat> with time and are erased so that the real life can begin. An awakening is an absolute change of state, a clear border. One cannot be sleeping and awake at the same time. The past and the present are thus separated and their coexistence is not possible. This interpretation of awakening goes, I would argue, hand in hand with the image of the independence movements, um, sorry, yeah, uh, with the independence movements in the public memory culture of Latvia and to a large extent a Latvian historiography. The 50 years of Soviet rule are seen as a lapse, a tragic, um, slip of fate, a forced depart. The refusal to include the five decades of states and people's history into the self-definition of Latvia and Latvians is at best illustrated by the fact that in 1991, the parliament claimed a continuity with Lat of Latvian Republic, of Republic of Latvia, sorry, founded in 1919. The independence was not acquired, it was recovered. 50 years between 1941 and 1991 are seen as an illegal occupation and an annexation by a foreign force. This interpretation ha does, however, leave very limited space to the understanding of Latvian everyday life in those 50 years and the cultural continuity of the society. While it was without doubt true that Latvia was occupied in 1941 and its peoples and res resources were harassed by the central government of the USSR for decades, it is also true that its people continued to live their lives under the regime. They were born and socialized in a country, and this country, and the rules by which they had to live hardly defined their everyday life less than the Latvian legacy of the interwar. As Yelena Zubkova noticed, the mainstream of Latvian historiography, and I would add memory culture too, is concentrated on the key events of the so-called victim narrative of Latvian peoples. Serious research on Latvian history between 1953 and 1987 that would not deal with resistance, but rather with the strategies of adaptation, still remain rather exemplary and seldom. Ruta Mezhevilka's novel goes against the popular representation of Russian times and their end in Latvia. The focus on the mundane, the Russian times, of course, in um, I don't even know how you call them. Anyway, um, the focus on the mundane, the everyday, and the individual challenges, challenges the pathos of the collective and the political that can be expected from a novel set in a narrated time and entitled Bored Latvia. The intense political developments that constitute the background of the narration only emphasize the fact that even though the politics influence the lives of the characters, they do not constitute or devour them completely. In contra contrary, at the center of the narrative stand the individuals and their relationships. Such a representation of Atmoda de-demonizes the Soviet past and humanizes the movements 
by exposing the detours from a mainstream narrative and opposing the heroic representation of the movement with an ironic stance. Today, I will exemplify the ironic depiction of fight for Latvian independence in Zimšalatve by pointing out the connection between the politics and adolescence which prevail in the novel. This parallel can hardly be overseen. The narrated time on level two spreads between the 16th and the 19th year of the first person narrator. The time of her, of her lar large life changes correlates with a carnation in the state she lives in. Even though there are some adults who voice uh, pro-Latvian <coughs> nationalist or uh, anti-Russian statements, most of the, at least seemingly, politically loaded contents are voiced by adolescents. For the adolescents' characters, the independence movement is primarily a possibility of a rebellion against the parents and teachers as well as the world that they live in, the Soviet society and state. It is the act of rebellion itself, the risk and the appeal of the prohibited that mostly interests the adolescents. The actual political contexts are secondary. Here's just one of many examples, and you will see it in the hands out, point two. Plani, which is a place, uh, Planetaris, um, a coffee place uh, in Riga. Plani is considered the coolest place. It's chock full in the afternoons. Finding, finding a free table is impossible. Plani is always swarming with people. A spirit of rebellion that can, has never been put in words reigns here. A special subtext of protest can be felt in the looks or tone of voice. All kinds of artists come here. They are wearing self-made and self-painted cloth and look deadly stylish." End of quote. Here, words like rebellion, protest, coolness, and style are used as synonyms. It is completely irrelevant what the protest is against, while the clothes of the young people are described in detail. The political agenda is never being thematized. The first person narrator goes to illegal screening, movie screenings, sings in an underground band, and takes part in a festival called Rock for Democracy while drinking for free Latvia. And yet her personal affairs are much more important to her than the political developments in the country. Movie screenings only interest her because of their coolness. Music, because of its rebellious powers, and most importantly, because her boyfriend plays in a band. Once the set, um, um, okay. um, they actually break up on the 7th um, of October in 1988, which is the day of the, one of the largest public demonstrations in the Soviet Union that was followed by the foundation of Latvian Popular Front. So they break up on this day. She only joins the demonstration because she doesn't want to be alone and follows the crowd. Once the uh, narrator arrives uh, to measure parks, she describes several characters that are festively dressed and obviously emotionally moved by the happening, while she herself remains unemotional. And this quote is also on your handout. I quote, I feel so far and foreign. I shouldn't have come here, end of quote. Her description of the speeches and demonstration is as strange and ironic. I can quote, everyone applauds. I too start clapping without thinking. We will learn to do this this summer. One has to sing after the speech. Another speech, another cheering. How familiar this is already, end of quote. She wonders if her boyfriend is there and answers her own question. The last quote. <laughs> it's impossible that the skeptical and ironical Andres would could eagerly sing folk songs and feel united with the peoples, end of quote. The speeches, leave, the speeches have lost their appeal to the narrator, not because they are less important and actual politically. We all know that by October 18, 1988, nothing was even close to being clear in the question of Latvian independence. But because we have they have stopped being dangerous and rebellious, be they became familiar. The reaction of the narrator is automatized. She claps without thinking and has a touch of ennui. In fact, attending a demonstration is rather uncool for her. Her cool, skeptical boyfriend would never do it. After realizing the impossibility of feeling an emotional bond with the crowd for a connect or a connection to the speakers, she leaves the venue. This episode illustrates the lack of actual interest in politics on behalf of the narrator, as well as the connection between the adolescent rebellion and the political awakening. Another important point towards the argument that I, however, can only show, shortly mention now is the fact that, <clears throat> sorry, the level one 
pardon, <clears throat> which depicts a grown-up narrator, or in this case, protagonist, is stripped off any political or national content to extend the borders with ignorance. While the narration on, on level two is clearly setting bordering between ethnic Latvians and Russians as two worlds that can never intersect, the word Russian is not mentioned a single time on level one. In fact, it is very probable that the protagonist is pregnant from an ethnic Russian, that is, has absorbed a part of him. This can, however, only remain a guess, since the ethnicity plays no role on level one, and such information is never directly provided. Oh, thank you. In this way, politics and especially national sentiments are clearly linked to level two and that is to adolescence. I will now move to the second novel. While well, irony, similarly to Zimishalatve, is one of the strongest tools of de demonification of the socialist past in Venice Kospen, it is used in a very different manner. Here, irony is primarily humoristic. The characters are represented as somehow lovable, but quite absurd, absurd and stereotypical. Other than concentrating on the individual experiences like uh, Ruta Mezhevilka, Katrin Inlich rather contributes to the scope of collective literary portraits of generation of Eastern German childhoods. This trend was started by um, an extremely popular book by Jana Henschel called uh, Zonenkinder and then Generation Golf by Florian Illis for um, Western Germany. Instead of depicting the terror of living in a so-called second dictatorship, the name introduced by some German historians and widely used in media, uh, by now, it, similarly to Henschel's book, creates a detailed image of the everyday life in the GDR with an ironic stance on the life under the regime. There is no mention of political bondages. If the narrator experiences any kind of lack of freedom, it is only because of her parents, not the authoritarian state that she lives in. In fact, the propaganda-filled life outside of the family is a space of freedom for the narrator, at least as long as she believes in the context that she is taught. It is the bourgeois gendered upbringing of her mother uh, and the strict sickly frugality of her father that suffocate narrator's life. Only her parents put her through experience she refers to negatively. There will be Sunday school, dance classes, and a ball, inadequate costumes for the carnival, and so far. The first act of independent thinking for the narrator is, not surprisingly, a silent rebellion against her parents that results in a choice of an astronaut-themed event in Pioneer's Palace, palace sorry, instead of Sunday school. The narrated child is not old enough to realize that she's choosing one system of beliefs over other, so science over religion, but only follows her feelings. While it is hard for her to believe in God, she surely believes in conquering the space and wants to be part of this scientific experiment. I argue that Venice Grossman suggests a flexible, pluralistic understanding of the socialist past which combines a special appreciation for the gender politics of the GDR and a simultaneous admittance of the imposs impossibility of a socialist utopia. I will illustrate the argument with two short episodes from the ch last chapter, A Vaxen or Grown Up. The title of the chapter is ironic. It is mimicking the pathos-filled speeches of teachers and parents surrounding the described event, the youth consecration. On this day, the 14 years old youth are told that they are now grown-ups with all the responsibility towards the society that come uh, with a new period of life. There are, however, no mentions of any kind of privileges or freedoms one could associate with being an adult. In opposite, the holiday is planned and executed by adults only, with the adolescent narrator having absolutely no saying in any kinds of um, aspects of the festival, be it the outfit, the program of the day, or the guests, or the menu, or the, the festive dinner. Even though the festival will use consecration, um, okay, there is something missing. Um, even though the festival is organized by school, which is uh, obviously um, associated with the state, it is uh, primarily the mother who um, pushes the girl through, um, pu puts the girl into a situation of non-freedom. Um, and uses these, the state-controlled events as an initialization, initialization into the womanhood. Um, and 
the most embarrassing event for this girl, uh, for the narrated child, is buying a new bra, even though she uh, still doesn't need it physically. It is a moment that every young adult woman, according to her mother, has to go through. Um, and I quote here, my mother didn't want to wait any longer, end of quote. Um, her mother is also supported by another grown-up female character, the shop assistant who sells the girl and her mother a bra in a wrong size. And another quote, I would grow up, grow into it one day, end of quote. The adolescent narrator is being initiated into the womanhood by grown-up characters who ignore the narrator's unwillingness to accept the gender role that is being imposed on her. She is physically uncomfortable with the attributes of womanhood that are completely unnecessary. She feels estranged from her own body when altered by these objects. And that's another um, quote from the handout. I quote, the two cups, which are the bra cups, that has to be filled with cotton because they're way too large. So the two cups stuck out like foreign bodies. The stra straps pinched into my shoulders, the fastener was squeezing my back, end of quote. The narrator feels trapped and even stripped down of her human qualities. Another quote, this is how horses must feel when they got into halter and then saddle put on them for the first time, <coughs> end of quote. Surely the narration is humorous, but the metaphors of entrapment, powerlessness, and foreignness are striking. Another grown-up uh, female character imposing a traditional role of mo woman upon uh, the narrator is Aunt Mützel. Uh, another quote, I, I would be in the right age to learn the most important things in life now, cleaning, cooking, and bringing up children. And now I will shortly, without uh, the quotes, we'll have to say that her, the answer of the um, narrator to these um, gender roles is that um, she prefers being a socialist woman with a job, an interesting job, uh, in science. And um, she talks about kindergarten, so the state taking part uh, in the traditional women's roles, for example, in bringing up children. Uh, oh, wow. Really? Um, Oh. Um, okay, I will have to uh, skip other examples, um, but I will conclude that the narrator's parents clearly represent the petty bourgeois who force their system of beliefs onto the narrator, while the socialist utopia mediated mostly through school offers her an alternative, a way out. The what is particular about the uh, grown-up chapter is the fact that the ultimate act of growing up uh, which here means um, entering the rebellious phase of adolescence, take place, place through an action rather associated with the capitalist system. You just have to believe me on that. This suggests a flexible understanding of life uh, in the GDR for the narrator. She weaves um, out freely between the two systems. She chooses the social securities of socialism and freedoms of capitalism. Um, and uh, in this way, the novel falls neatly into a trend that has started about 10 to 15 years in Germany that um, goes for deserptization of the GDR and the incorporation of its past, as well as um, ways of looking into its um, reality, not only as an authoritarian state, but as a state of, for example, social, secu uh, social securities and rather progressive gender roles. I will have to leave out everything else, I'm sorry. Right. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Olga, for bringing up many subjects, certainly worth of discussion later. And we move forward. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Laura, Laura Scheite. Uh, she's a researcher at the uh, Institute of Lithuanian Literature and uh, Folklore, Department of Comparative Literature. And she's also a postdoctoral post student at the Lithuanian University of Educational Sciences. And uh, uh, she has uh, worked uh, in the area of uh, postcolonial studies uh, Imagology and Comparative Literature, please. Uh, thank you, Pauls. Uh, in what follows, I am going to examine the image of Lithuanians and Latvians that appear in recent emigre fiction. 
The methodological background, or rather perspective for the study at hand, is that of imagology. Uh, the study of uh, cross-national perceptions and images as ex expressed in literary discourse. Images presented in the text can vary according to their perspective. A fundamental distinction is made between auto-image or self-image and hetero-image. They're referring to the reputation others have about the nation's character. And this, is, this aspect I will concentrate on today. Uh, as a source material, I chose several books written in contemporary exile, which share some basic assumptions about the bolts and discuss various aspects of how we are perceived by others. In most of the novels, uh, the field of action is Britain. And here I brought a postcard which shows that uh, this British emigration in Lithuania is a very uh, recent and important topic. And uh, I will just uh, give it to the audience. Uh, and I would like to um, attract your attention to the purse that this bird is holding here. And it's written UK. So, thank you. Uh, as a comparison and to prove my point, I will also briefly address the novel Mission in London by Bulgarian author Alek Popov. And I wanted uh, just to show you a slide with a, a wonderful cover. You, you see it here. The aim of the presentation is to explore the manifestations and interpretations of bolts and to suggest the possible strategies our authors take to subvert the circulating characterological reputations or hetero images. So mainly two parts of the presentation. And uh, to save time, I will not be reading all quotes I present in the slides. Uh, you will see the most characteristic passages there. So images of Baltics as distant, strange, and almost mythical land has a long-standing tradition in literature since the narratives of post-war emigration. As I was researching this topic in my uh, dissertation, I can compare a bit. Uh, so imaginary Lithuania or Latvia is placed and mapped in the strangest corners of the planet, from Asia to Hungary. Uh, in most cases, uh, the citizens of Western Europe do not bother and do not see a point at all uh, to divide our immigrants um, who come from previous Eastern Bloc to separate ethnic nationalities. For example, Bulgarian girl Katya is confused with Russian by her accent. Accent, he made a slight arm swing. Are you Russian? No, Bulgarian. It does not matter. And as you see, it, uh, this... Um, Typology is visible in, in different quotes that it's all the same where you are from or it does not matter where you are from. Uh, in a great number of narratives, I spotted a morbid tendency to identify Baltic countries with Russia. Uh, Baltic people are also located in the same association field with Russians, with Russian peoples, people. For foreigners, Russia still remains a convenient metonymy of the whole Soviet Union. And for example, Latvia, Lithuania, or Ukraine was all the same, says uh, Willis Latsi, uh, Latvian author, or Lithuania equals Russia, I receive an imaginary identification card, cold and vodka, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, vodka as excessive Vodka and excessive drinking, as well as cold associations, uh, and uh, mm, mentioned, they're mentioned in, in, in uh, several quotes, and uh, once again, they can serve as a fictional reference to the Russian background. Uh, together with geographical arguments, uh, att attribution to polar zone can also carry historical political reference to Siberia and deportations or the Soviet stagnation. Uh, in the narratives under discussion, it is possible to detect a certain social type, which I named uh, Eastern, Eastern European. Uh, applying terminology of leading imagologist, uh, Dutch imagologist, Joab Lersen, we can call it stock type. 
just a common type collecting a lot of different features in, in it. Uh, when foreigners identify uh, Baltic emigres uh, in the foreign space, first of all, they invoke politically defined regional attribution Eastern European, which automatically encompass the entire repertoire of stereotypical images, such as inferior figure of lower background with damaged self-esteem, status of unqualified laborer, or if it's a woman, a person of no reputation guided by a morality. Uh, and uh, national dependence, uh, Lithuanian, Latvian, or ethnic arguments, as you can understand, are left aside. Recurring uh, Russian typology allows us to identify cliches of social characteristics. Uh, in Popov's novel, Mission in London, which I already mentioned, uh, symbiotic dependence uh, on Russian empire is stressed employing a powerful image of Bulgarian restaurant, uh, which is resting in the basement of the Russian restaurant. Uh, I quote, Bulgarian restaurant was contempt to remain in the belly of Matryoshka doll like an embryo who is afraid to be born and at the same time forces one's way out, while finally senses the umbilical cord is tightly stretched and juice of life is flowing through. Uh, so using the image of Matryoshka doll, which is considered a quintessential image of Russianness uh, and a paradigm of womb, Popov emphasizes Bulgarian economic, mental, and social dependence on Mother Russia. Uh, in the best case, local trees emigrate as a waste of space. In the worst, they openly demonstrate and declare their contempt and superiority. Uh, and this is what I call social hetero images uh, that Lithuanians and Latvians are considered to be second-rate human beings. Uh, local treat immigrants from Eastern Europe as if they were aborigines, criminal elements. In British point of view, they are in the place of shit. Sorry for the expression, it's from Formina, Alexandra Formina, Lithuanian author book. Uh, perhaps not accidentally, the subheading of Mukta Pavlo's book, The Champignon Testament, which originally sounds black bolts visiting Celts, was translated to English, bloody bolts in Ireland. And in my opinion, English translator just skipped the point or, and even mis misinterpreted uh, the initial social and ethnic meaning it had. Uh, in the novel uh, Stroika with a view to London by Latvian author Willis Lati, it is, Latvians are positioned hierarchically lower even than uh, Afro-Americans. The main character work for the, works for the black man from Ghana. Uh, and for example, in the other sequence, black rappers of African descent stop their luxurious cars uh, to mock uh, Latin immigrants who are searching for food in, in the trash containers. Uh, in uh, Lithuanian author's um, Elvira Davina's novel, uh, Ireland, the Distant Close Island, Lithuanians are paid worse and have fewer privileges than Filipinian girls doing the same job in the same nursing home. Uh, so we can see that uh, different social, racial, and national groups which reside in Britain for a while and already associate themselves with local British, Green, and Eastern Europeans and consider them inferior. Uh, I quote from Foreman again, uh, Polish and Lithuanians, just like all other people from Eastern Europe, are reckoned third brothers here. British cannot get how a same person can sweat it out for the sake of money, do all kinds of shitty jobs, live wherever, and refuse any pleasures. Uh, but among Eastern European emigrants, uh, we can also trace uh, some kind of uh, social gradation. For example, Romanians, Bulgarians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and other immigrants from countries not yet belonging to, to the European Union respect the Bolts and reckon with them uh, as they can get personal benefit from, from Baltic people. 
uh, I quote, you can buy all documents from Lithuanians, Yebog, everything what you need. Uh, this is a quote from Lati, it is again. On the other hand, uh, such reputation of illegal merchants does not bring much glory to Lithuanians. Uh, Willis Lati, it is, uh, states that uh, the Bolts were leaders in the fight of, for survival because they gained an advantage over other countries of Eastern Bloc as they earlier entered the European Union, gained a more stable position in the labor market, and knew English better than representatives of uh, other countries. Uh, I quote again from Lati, it is, all Lithuanians spoke English better or worse. Britain offers a lot of job possibilities, but in Baltic narratives, uh, uh, British, Britain appears as a hostile country possessing imperial mentality. British film masters everywhere, like Russians, says Fomina. Uh, British share a sense of almighty master and postcolonial attitude. Uh, and I noticed uh, it's expressed through different narratives uh, that Lithuanians uh, feel affinity to Irish as residents of a smaller country that uh, historically experienced the same fate of subaltern uh, because they were forced to leave their country and nearly lost their language and identity just like we were, uh, while British are perceived as outer imperial enemy, as Latsy puts it. Uh, discussing hetero images attributed to Baltic people, gender aspect has also be, to be considered. Uh, Eastern European women often carries a stereotypical reputation of a woman of easy virtue. Uh, and uh, they're looking for rich husbands or they're just uh, selling her body for, for the reason to earn more money. Uh, and here is a quote from, again from uh, Popov. Uh, you, have you, you have become gophers of the West, serving personnel. Give me a buck, I will show you my pussy. So much of your philosophy. Do you enjoy showing pussy to every passerby? Uh, but um, Bulgarian girl, girl Katya, uh, who follows this philosophy, in Popov's novel, uh, she works as a stripper at the nightclub uh, and does not see anything immoral or sinful in selling her body because it was easier than sitting in a shitty shop or washing dishes and much more profitable. Uh, and here I would like to address uh, openly sexually provoking uh, presentation of um, uh, Polish in uh, this year's uh, Eurovision Song Contest, and here I have a picture of it, uh, which was maybe meant like provocation, but nevertheless entrenched the stereotype of Eastern European women as easily accessible. Uh, moral degradation of Lithuanian women is especially evident in Ivoshkevich's play Expulsion Story for an Apple, which uh, my colleague Ushra Yurgutena was already talking about in plenary session. Uh, so, ugly Lithuanian girl who had ambitions to become a photographer when she emigrated to London finally ends up being a strip dancer. And again, we see this typology of uh, stripping in different narratives. A symptomatic scene of the place, play deals with the British man who disrupts the identity of Agle, calling her ugly, because he finds it too difficult to pronounce the specific Lithuanian name. Uh, Agle is both a popular female name in Lithuania and at the same time uh, a word meaning spruce, uh, which is one of the national trees for Lithuanians. Uh, and for every Lithuanian, this name evokes uh, the association with one of the most famous Lithuanian folk tales, Agla, the Queen of Serpents, uh, which is considered one of the most archaic and best known Lithuanian fairy tales and the richest in references of Baltic mythology. 
Lithuanian mythologist Gintaras Beresnevičius went as far as to believe that it's a, a version of Lithuanian Theogonic myth. Uh, frequently repeated, uh, this characteristic of ugly uh, becomes a self-image. It turns from hetero image, turns to self-image. Uh, I'm so sick of this ugly, says Agla. For him, it's a joke, English humor of a kind. But for me, personality changes. Uh, so we, here we can speak of the construction of a mythological consciousness and a fundamental shift in immigrant immig mentality. And what's more, Lithuanian girl, uh, as we know, or maybe probably foreigners do not know, that Lithuanians are traditionally considered pretty women. So she becomes the ugly with all the respective associations and implications of this world. Uh, and uh, here I have a map of, uh, of, of Europe uh, where, um, as you see, Lithuanians and Latvians uh, get into this area of strippers and vodka. Uh, so this is, uh, again, a very common typology and uh, the abundance of similar images in the social sphere and uh, in the literature uh, show that uh, they're circulating. They come to literature from, from the social sphere, from reality. How much time do I still have? Two minutes, okay. Okay, so I will, I will skip the conclusions because the time is running out. I just wanted to, before I finish, I just wanted to offer um, a few a few ways how our authors deconstruct using the terminology offered in the first plenary session, deconstruct the negative hetero images uh, employing different strategies. First, of, first is what I call satirical subversion or mocking back, uh, which can be traced in uh, several authors' books. Uh, here you can see the quotes, so I will not be reading them anymore. Uh, so second strategy uh, I called analytical subversion, uh, which actually expresses dramatism of the situation. And uh, really serious authors, authors employ this strategy in their texts. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, Manfeldes uh, mm, mm, books named Zimtanite, means uh, at the same time the little motherland and as my Latvian colleagues suggested it could also signify homemade vodka, moonshine in English. And the excessive drinking is analytically reinterpreted as a means of forgetting, distancing from the harsh reality. And the third strategy is what I called uh, raising self-respect. Uh, for example, Otto was also Lai Mukta Pavela, in my opinion, offers uh, means to avoid this um, negative uh, influence offered by other countries by just uh, raising uh, national or ethnic, in Mokta Pavel's case, uh, uh, self-respect and provides people with a positive self-image. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all three speakers. Any questions in the audience? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, one question to each of the speakers. How to proceed? Okay. Uh, my question to Perez Sanchez. Uh, why do you think that Niegos is a romantic poet and 
can we speak of three different streams of supranational literature? Ibero-Occitan, Balkan, East, Baltic. And can we speak, uh, can we identify that we just post factum label some phenomena from these different streams as romantic? This is my question to Perez Sanchez. Maybe I'll try to, to ask all three questions for all to have time to think about them. Uh, my question to Olga Basilevica. How do you think uh, which agenda or agendas does the demonization of the socialist epoch serve uh, in the case of your novels? Uh, a petit bourgeois agenda, an agenda of high intellectuals, some kind of leftist one, a liberal, a conservative, uh, and uh, can you draft a map of such agendas in Latin and respectively in German literature, and can you locate your novels in such kind of maps? And my question... Uh, to Lago Scheite, to Lago Lago Scheite, it's uh, the, the shortest one. Uh, how do you think why Latvians are set lower than Afro Americans or Filipinos? Uh, or Lithuanian? Okay, why both are set lower? Thank you very much. I don't remember uh, all your questions, but I will try to answer the first one. Why Niegos uh, can be characterized uh, like a romantic poet? First, uh, firstly, because uh, Niegos, uh, the literary education of Niegos is uh, the romantic one of his time. He read uh, French and, uh, and uh, Russian author, romantic authors of, uh, of his time. And uh, not only by himself, but and, uh, also because uh, his, uh, his uh, tutor, when he was a teenager, his tutor, his uh, master, was uh, one of the most prominent Serbian uh, romantic of, of, the, of, of the time. And also because the, his most famous epos, epic, uh, Gorski Vienat, mm, uh, can be uh, placed among the national epic, ro national romantic epic of the 19th century. Mm, uh, for some characteristics you can find in this in this uh, long poem. First, the, the use of uh, the oral uh, Serbian uh, poetry, the oral uh, epic uh, poetry, mm. and uh, other uh, inner elements in the in the po in the poem, like uh, the use through all of uh, all of it of uh, some uh, popular motifs, for example. Uh, the colo, that is a popular dance, and it was popular dance in Montenegro in that time. And the rest, popular tradition uh, dance. I just, to, I just wanted to know whether you, you, you think it is possible to, to to speak about three separate literary Ah, okay, okay, okay. Which is yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh, 
my framework is a comparative one, but not a genetic one. Understand uh, this, uh, these poems, uh, the, the Latvian one, the, uh, the, uh, the Serbian or Montenegrin one, and the Catalan one, uh, are not genetically uh, related. But uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, are part of a major European system in the terms of the critic, uh, the Israeli critic uh, Itamar Ben Ben a, a big uh, romantic policy system. So they uh, present uh, some common characteristics. This is my point, uh, in short. Um, thank you for quite an interesting question um, that I've been posing myself for a while, I guess. Um, so um, it will be probably easier to answer that for Germany, so I'll start with the simplest part. Um, I would argue that um, in the case of Katrin Inlich, um, it is rather the we have to think that it's, it was written in 1998 and uh, published in 2003, which was a quite different situation in the, con concerning the representation of Eastern Germany um, in Germany, United Germany than now. Um, the agenda back then was quite simple, the, uh, the claim of um, legitimate parts in the, uh, um, in the past of United Germany and not being seen as this marginalized weird thing that you know poor poor Eastern Germans had to drive these trabants and um, were always uh, followed by Stasi. Um, it is it is part of a large uh, scope of works that are um, either following a similar pattern uh, working with um, humor and irony or uh, being more serious. Um, definitely a part of a l very, very large um, intellectual leftist movement that is very strong in Germany and um, that has been, especially last elections with the um, you know, election of the social um, democrats into um, the parliament as the majority. <clears throat> the part of the, of the large uh, coalition um, shows an interest, in, at least in the intellectual, in the young uh, generation, in the socialist um, securities. At least some of the some of the um, things that um, today's Germany can take out from um, its socialist past. Um, but of course, also some parts of um, you know liberal uh, agenda, pure entertainment um, books and movies. Um, Eastern German kitsch sells very well. That's also something we have to think of. Um, so I, I feel like the book would be read a little bit differently now because of the last 15 years um, as when it was written. As for Latvia, um, I th would think it's a more tricky situation. Um, the way that I read Dimitri Latvia, and it could be that someone else in the room uh, disagrees with me, it does uh, offer um, a kind of um, criticism of capitalist and consumerist society and the blind uh, faith in free market that ruled the early, the first 10, 15 years of independent Latvia. Um, but it also, I feel like the the way of you know de stereotyped and de demonized um, description of um, the Russian times is a way of showing the individual um, experience rather than the stereotypical. Um, yes, which which also I mean I I couldn't talk about the two levels, but it's very important to see how the character develops. We only have a huge gap. We don't know what happened between 91 and 2005. Not really. Um, but the big difference that happens to her political um, stance, I think, is uh, quite critical. 
As for the map of um, the type of, of, of novels that I work with, which would be um, childhood memories, um, is actually not as fictional childhood memories, is not that popular in Latvia amongst younger generation. It's rather a, a, um, a field that is widely used by older generation Latvian writers. Um, I think that something that um, my colleague here talked about, um, the exile, the, the la last uh, waves of immigration um, have changed um, the perception largely because there has been more criticism of um, imperialist and capitalist systems. Um, but I, I wouldn't really know where to map it. I, I, think, I think the left, um, the intellectual left is still quite, oh, I hope I don't say something too, um, still rather conscious in the Baltic states, so I would put it into a rather liberal, critic part, um, but I think there's some movement there too. I don't know if I answer your question, but that would be my thoughts. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think Latvians and Lithuanians are uh, positioned lower than other countries because uh, at first they are newcomers and they not yet have a stable position in the labor market. Uh, but uh, those people residing in, in Britain longer, they uh, have a symbolic uh, uh, superiority uh, in comparison with, uh, with those Baltic people and uh, they have some um, uh, some uh, things to show, like uh, to stress their superiority, like this, uh, for example, luxurious car, which I mentioned. And um, another aspect that I would like to reflect on in this matter, uh, uh, I think that uh, Lithuanians and Latvians uh, have a damaged self-image, and it also reflects uh, uh, the uh, attitude of other people uh, because they led to disdain and uh, to condemn, condemn themselves. Uh, they led to be treated as subaltern. Uh, for example, uh, again uh, uh, referring to Ivashkevich's play, uh, there is a se sequence uh, which already my colleague mentioned her, that uh, mm, Lithuanian serves as a dog, bringing the short ducks from the swamp for English aristocrat. And uh, uh, what is uh, worst, that uh, this uh, Lithuanian, he does not reflect this situation. He uh, he's proud that he has a better, a better food, better dress, uh, uh, and uh, some other, um, some, some, uh, symbolic benefits, let's say. Uh, and um, I think that uh, those uh, other nationalities, they are, uh, they can uh, defend themselves. They are maybe more aggressive. Uh, they can demand from other people. But both, they are happy with what they get and uh, they allow to, to be, treated like this. I would like to add something to my colleague about this theme, about uh, this uh, social program of the Indian immigrants. And she is, of course, right that uh, the Indians reflect, uh, didn't reflect their position. But I think that in Vashkevich's place, this is the question why that the Englishmen didn't, didn't reflect their position too. To, 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 give, uh, uh, to give a job for the Vienna as the dog. <laughs> so 
So it is more of position not only of immigrants, but for uh, most of the masters of England too, for aristocrats of England too, to, to, to sell, to give such job for a man. So it is a, and uh, uh, the other, I would like to thank for this paper uh, about romanticism because I'm interested in this uh, in this literature too, and I would only like to add to your to your paper. You said that you you did it uh, interested in genetic way, but uh, it is interesting. I think that uh, when we speak about, uh, for example, Lithuanian romanticism. Uh, it is uh, useful to know the uh, romantic uh, school, you know, a grand romantic school of the Vilnius University, which was formed in the beginning of the 19th century. Of course, the, the classic poets, the classic writers of Poland were the members of this uh, school, Mickiewicz, Slovatsky, Kraszewski, but they uh, interpreted they are Poland as Lithuania. And they wrote a lot of poems about the past of Lithuania. So this multicultural uh, events of the school is something interesting, I think, to, to think about it today. And uh, the answer to the question of our colleagues uh, is uh, this is able to put to later romantic to, to them. I would say that not, of course, because in this romantic school at Vilnius University, of course they understand himself as romantic, and they know English and German romantics, and they have good discussions with Warshaw literary uh, critics, which were uh, of, uh, of classicistic tradition. So the uh, self-conscious well, was romantic, of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any, any other questions or comments? I have one uh, kind of uh, larger question or comment, which was inspired mostly by uh, Miguel Angel and Laura's talks. But but I'll be uh, and probably the, this comment would address um, also other people in the audience. But uh, I'll begin with a with a short uh, question um, to um, Olga. Uh, thanks. I, I think for what was earlier an exemplary reading of of two uh, texts. Uh, the question is rather small, but perhaps uh, it can, uh, I don't know, uh, can give some, some push to your thoughts and maybe some, someone else. At least for me, it was interesting that uh, when you moved to, to the German text, when it grows in, uh, you said uh, that um, here you find a kind of humoristic irony. A humoristic irony, which is, uh, in Latvia we normally say that we miss this this irony, we miss this this power of the construction. Probably we see it in some texts, in Lithuanian texts like Ivaškevičius, but I would argue or think that nothing of the kind so powerful we have here. And the question is, don't you think that there still is a difference which is of a geopolitical kind between East German author uh, who, with her experience, uh, has been incorporated in a larger political unit in the strong Federal Republic of Germany, when this playfulness come uh, be more uh, like I don't know, more free or, or whatever the word would be, and uh, the case of of uh, units like Latvia or Lithuania, uh, which after being separated from a larger political unit as the Soviet Union, they become smaller and they also become objectively more fragile. Is there a kind of difference which could be taken into account in this context? 
Um, thank you for your question. I definitely don't say that it's a question of my mentality. Uh, of course, you can't really compare. It's not only um, the question of we have to think that Eastern Germany, of course the Eastern German experience is being marginalized. If you just see what kind of holidays, museums uh, reign in Germany, you will see that. But um, Eastern Germany joined, reunified with a country that went through the 60s and the 70s through the historical stride, who has a very pluralistic understanding of history that in the, you know, at least theoretically embraced the plurality of experiences in the very beginning technically in 1989, which was not the case in Latvia where you had to fight for everything. You had to build a new school, a new historiography from scratch. Um, theoretically entering the, the European, European you know, um, academic or cultural society practically actually just having to build everything anew. So of course it's a very different context. And um, it's also that, you know, there are more Eastern Germans than there are Latvians, so there's just more literature by quantity, so there's also more chance of having developing a whole s stream of that kind of humoristic. Um, I would also not claim that it's better or worse. I mean, uh, Meja Vilko's book is very ironic. It's sometimes quite funny, but it's this kind of typical Latvian kind of sad irony. Um, so I would agree with you on that. Um, we definitely have to set it in context. Um, just as a Latvian reader, I would embrace uh, a more kind of free humor. Sometimes I think maybe we just need to have a little bit more time so that we allow that playfulness um, with our history. Um, and I think it's also a point in that Mezhevelko chooses Atmode rather than the 40s and the 50s, where I feel like still being ironic and funny about that time in Latvia is way too sensitive. You cannot really go there. So um, there's definitely, the ice is thinner here than in Germany, I would say. Thank you very much for your answer. I think it was interesting that Laura also said uh, at the end of, of her talk that somehow all, uh, you felt that you have to say that that serious, really serious authors imply tragedy. <laughs> so there's a kind of difference. But um, okay, uh, I said that the second comment would be larger. Perhaps I keep it short, but I hope that we maybe get some response either from you in the panel or from Professor Talvet or from Vanessa or from Jordan. Uh, what I was thinking about uh, hearing this. Uh, representations at the end of these different romantic traditions at the beginning. Uh, I think we speak quite a lot uh, about the position of the Baltic uh, lands or countries between East and West, uh, but I think there is a lot to talk about when we think in terms of North and South. And uh, for example, Yuri Talvet said in the morning that um, Christian Jak Peterson, if I if I um, render it correctly, he built his n Nordic identity to a certain extent, uh, taking an example, let's say in, in in Dante directly or in indirectly. And I think that probably these similarities, Laura, you used also this parallel between Latin Lithuanian texts and Bulgarian one. Probably there is a kind of um, more similarities than the uh, think of normally. Uh, we haven't researched, I think, at least in Latvia, all the possible ties, including Pumpurs and other ties with, with Southern Europe. And probably it's not the case vice versa, but I think it's one direction we might think in in, in future. A comment, I don't know whether anyone feels. This was uh, the, uh, all this what you uh, told us uh, was uh, the first variant of the beginning of my paper, of the opening, so to say. <laughs> but today I didn't have enough time to introduce it. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. It's time to move on. I hope we'll continue. Uh, these discussions uh, during the break and uh, in next conference panels uh, today and tomorrow. It's time for lunch now. Uh,
let's meet downstairs. Thank you once again for papers and for discussion.